The structure of the afternoon and evening programs is designed primarily to introduce and celebrate our 2022 guest of honor, William Mangum. So I'm not going to stand here for 15 minutes and tell you about him. I now present him in his own image and voice on the subject of an artist's perspective. He has selected people who will talk more about him after we have enjoyed dinner. And cumulatively, by the end of the evening, I think you will know this man and you will see his brilliance illustrated here in this room. Bill? Okay. <laughs> Nothing like that to unnerve you just a, a tad. Well, by golly, well, thank you. Clarence, great to see you. And so many other friends that I didn't have a chance to say hello to before we got started today. Truly, uh, this is a amazing honor. Uh, Mr. Lee, I'd like to thank you also for being here. Very proud of your remarks last year, and I hope I can be just as colorful and eloquent in what I've got to say. You know, as I think about opportunities like this, and we gather and you meet strangers for the first time, oftentimes you get into the conversation. It's not before long that they, they ask you, you know, well, what do you do for a living? And early in my career, I said, well, I'm an artist. I know, I know, I know, but what do you do for a living? <laughs> Was always the response. And then shortly thereafter, the second comments would be, uh, well, what do you do for a living? Well, I'm an artist. You know, my dad's an artist too. I said, really? Well, tell me about that. Yeah, he takes uh, Coke liter bottles and he cuts them in half and he paints them and he turns them into flower pots. I'm going, oh, yeah, that, that's, that's good. That's competition right there. <laughs> and then I uh, thought, you know, maybe I shouldn't tell people I'm an artist. That's a little vague. Maybe a little more specific. So I remember being down at Marshallburg, this fishing port down at the coast, and I saw these boats going back and forth, so I hopped on one with some fishermen to get some photos, and one of them asked me in this great dialect, he said, so uh, what do you do for a living? I said, well, I'm a painter. He said, oh my God, that's the worst job in the world. I'd rather gut fish the rest of my life than paint boats. <laughs> so that wasn't going anywhere. And then I thought, well, maybe I'll try it one more time. So I go to a cocktail party, and they said, what do you do for a living? I said, well, I'm a uh, painter. They said, oh, good. Interior, exterior. I said, interior. He said, you got a card? I'd like to have a quote. Can you come by this afternoon and give me some room measurements? So, you know, being this artist thing was always really kind of difficult. So the day, I'm going to lead you in and give you a little perspective of how I got to be a professional artist. It began years ago. This is my sweet mother, Louise. And mom was 27 when that picture was taken. And uh, a lovely lady. And she met this gentleman right here by the name of William Mangum. And he a dapper fellow, yeah. He was in the Army. Interestingly enough, mom was actually married during this time to my brother's father, Bob Carey. And they met down in Southern Pines and fell in love because that first marriage was kind of coming towards an end. And there was lots of excitement about starting over, refreshing. But during that time, mom got pregnant and had me. This is Billy Mangum. And needless to say, they were quite proud and really looking forward to a new chapter in their lives. Once that divorce was sort of put behind them, they would start anew. But then there was an accident. My father was involved in that. He was driving at the time, and the fellow that was riding with them died in the accident, and my father went to prison. So that dream of gathering and starting a new chapter quickly came to an end. And more interesting is that during that same time, my mother's mother, died and my brother 
was 10 at the time, I'm one, and they said, Louise, it's time for you to come and get Bobby. So here my mother is single. She has a 10-year-old and she has a newborn one-year-old when this gentleman comes into the picture. This fellow's name is Hugh Mangum. Sounds familiar. Hugh is the brother of my father. And recognizing that mom was in a very precarious situation, he said to my mother, if you will marry me, I will provide for you and your kids. And she did. Now, Pops enlisted in the Navy when he was 17, and he served in the Navy for 21 years. Pretty amazing story behind that. And, uh, you know, it must have taken tremendous amount of courage to pull us together to provide in such unusual circumstances. And to the right is my brother, and Pops also had a daughter, our sister Elizabeth, during that time. When I was eight years old, my mother had a stroke and she was paralyzed on her right hand side and in the middle of the night I was picked up and brought to North Carolina from a naval base, Newport, Rhode Island. Bob was down in New Orleans going to college, Elizabeth, my sister and I were there. And uh, you know, you just, you're trusting. You have these three people, my aunts and my uncles, and they gather us up and they take us back. And I wind up in this little hollow called Mamers, North Carolina, and my sister Elizabeth winds up in Raleigh with Aunt Dora. Well, this was my recipient, Aunt Kate, and she welcomed me like no other, just like a child of her own. And I remember that first morning that I came into her dining area, sat at the table, there was this bowl of cornflakes, big box cornflakes, and I pulled them out, and I took this pitcher of milk and I poured milk onto it, and I put a heaping spoonful in my mouth and I started, I started gagging and I spewed it across the table. And Aunt Kate came running out, Billy, 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 you okay? I said, Aunt Kate, I said, that milk's gone bad. She said, no, it hasn't. I just milked the cow a little while ago. So needless to say, there was this huge, rude awakening coming from a military base where there was a commissary and living on the farm for the next few years. But there was lots of great lessons taught to me during that time. Aunt Kate would always tell you, you know, remember where you came from. Pops leaned into him and he said, you know, what's really important is to get a good education. And then during all those trials and uh, instances, mom would always say, remember, it just takes time, honey. Well, I wound up at Boone Trail High School. It was K through 12, very small country school. And I'll never forget landing there, lots of insecurities, as you can imagine. And uh, one of my teachers took a drawing that I did, a crayon drawing, and entered it in the North Carolina State Fair. Well, it won this blue ribbon. I mean, it was about the size of a pie pan. And I was so proud, I just wore around, strutting around, and I was really excited. And all during those early years, art was the means of escape for me. You know, in reality, it allowed me to fantasize, to get away, to really maybe not live in the presence. Because as a young boy, eight, nine, ten, thrown into that circumstance, you just were, you weren't quite sure what was happening. So art was that means that I could really kind of survive and entertain myself. When I got from Boone Trail, I wound up finishing high school in Fayetteville. And I gotta be honest with you, I was a terrible student. I wasn't inspired academically, I just really didn't care. But art, thank the Lord I had art because I could do bulletin boards for extra credit. And I could get through Spanish, and I get through algebra, and all those things. But I did graduate, I wasn't at the highest end of my class, but I did eventually get through. And I, I went to uh, Sand Hills Community College and it was there that I poured myself into art. And all of a sudden, I went from the bottom to the top. Believe it or not, I made dean's list, of all things, going to a community college. And then once I finished there, though, I was thinking I could go on, maybe get a degree in art, maybe do something else with it. So there were two schools for art. One was East Carolina, home of the Pirates. Great football, basketball. The other was UNCG, had a great art department. 
And as we began to measure both of them together, there was one distinct thing that UNCG had, women. And I mean a lot of them, because it used to be the women's college at UNCG. So when I enrolled, the ratio was 10 to 1. First semester, I'm on academic probation. <laughs> I can't imagine why. I really can't imagine why. And then there was this woman right here, Cynthia Jean Berkeley, that kind of stepped into my life where actually I was in a room visiting another young lady on a date or playing tennis. When she walked by and she came back in and sort of caught my eye, and we hit it off. And that really became a love affair that today has gone on for nearly 50 years. While I was at UNCG learning to do art, I'll never forget my professor, Bert Carpenter, who was the head of the art department. Very much on the center stage like this, there were 250 students out in the audience. And as he was walking back and forth, he had his pipe. He could smoke back on campus back then. And he stopped. And he pointed out at us, his little skinny finger, bony. He said, I can tell you right now, only two of you are going to make a living as an artist. Well, I was sitting right about there, and I stood up, and I turned around. He said, young man, what are you doing? I said, well, Mr. Carpenter, I'm looking for that other person you're talking about. <laughs> and truth be known, that is really what happened. There was really only about two of us that made a livelihood from it. As I went through uh, UNCG, got to my senior year, I decided to do a painting for my mom for Christmas. And like any student, I didn't have any money, so I went to a local dime store, bought a 59-cent tray of watercolors. I came back to the dorm. I had sort of played with watercolors in the past. My brother would have me down on summer visits, and I did a poor painting. Did you ever burn that painting, Bob? Did you lose it Some, uh, of his home? But I was doing my student teaching up in Stokes County when I came across this scene. And I, that night I pulled out a sheet of drawing paper. And this was really maybe the first real attempt at trying to put together a composition. I went back to Woolworths. I bought a $2.98 frame. I wrapped it up and I gave it to mom for Christmas. And she said, Billy, that is unbelievable. I said, mom, I think I have found something that really resonates with me. Watercolors, I think that's it. So I took my life savings, $4.98, went back to a little art store and I bought some paint and I began to teach myself how to paint. And while I was at UNCG, I was working my way through the student union building and one of the professors saw me painting. He said, Bill, that is fantastic. He said, why don't you be our artist in residence? I said, what's that? He said, well, you, you paint live, you know, you come and we'll pay you $75 and you can put a show on it here in the student union building. Well, my brother, Bob Carey, underwrote that opportunity. I borrowed $300 from him, I framed up 10 paintings, and I sold every one of them. And I knew this is what I would do for the last, rest of my life. So that first painting went from that and then two years later, I was doing scenes like this. This is Wes Jefferson which turned into my first limited edition print. When I came out of school with my Master of Fine Arts, I really had some great success. There was something called newspapers back then, and they, they were anxious to write articles about up and coming talent. And I like this one in, in particular, as I leaned into it, I'll read it with you. It says, Lexington has its Timberlake. If you've not heard of him, that's Bob Timberlake. <laughs> High Point, it's Steve Sebastian. North Wilkesboro, it's Nichols. And Greensboro, it's Mangum. You see that word right there? Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. They must have been talking to Bert Carpenter because you know, they didn't find me. But I was determined. I absolutely leaned into it. And I did. Everything that I was painting was really kind of resonating. Even this article right here says, North Carolina's Bill Mangum attributes his success as a painter to hard-headedness. You have to be stubborn. You had to have a lot of tenacity back then. And uh, it was really good. So what I was doing was really kind of painting was in my own backyard at the time. Scenes that were quite familiar, this was Harvard's Inn, and then I would go down to Ocracoke Island and capture those lovely scenes. But what really began to separate me from my competition was competing. 
was entering my paintings in shows, not locally, but nationally and internationally. And my local subjects were gaining pretty amazing attributes. Even this one in 1981, I won a very nice award in London, England at the International Watercolor Society. Matter of fact, my paintings were so popular back then, I had one stolen <laughs> from this university. It was at the North Carolina Watercolor Society when I had one of my paintings sort of hijacked student. I'd love to find that piece again, It'd be kind of fun. Well, as things led on and I had great success, you know, having insecurities would make you lean into material things. And back in the day, Cadillacs were something to envy, maybe even something to prize. Haven't you promised yourself a Cadillac long enough? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. So I went out and I bought one. And then shortly thereafter, this ad came out and says, you've earned it. And I thought, you're darn right, darn too. And so I went out and I bought that one too. So I had a I had a sedan de ville and I had a yellow Eldorado and I just thought, man, oh man, life doesn't get much better than this until 1980 when the recession hit and the Carter administration came in and interest rates went way up and I was totally exposed and I was so naive, I did not know how to handle my success and I had to file for a straight bankruptcy. I crashed and burned, and it really, really broke me. But it was the best thing that put life in perspective for me. Because I gotta be honest with you, I took for granted really where I come from. It all began with a 59 cent tray of watercolors, and I felt like anybody, anybody could do what I was doing if you applied yourself. Well, maybe you had to spend $4.98. I don't know. But it was during that time that people had been telling me that I had a special gift. And I thought, well, maybe. He said, no, you know, God has given you a very unique talent. And then it really dawned on me that he, he did. So I asked for some forgiveness. I asked if he would give me a second chance. And the Lord blessed me. And he took me into his fold. And really during that time, it was the family. It gave me the goal of something to work towards to dig out. Cynthia was steadfast. Kids didn't know any better. But, you know, without a family, you really didn't have something to work towards. So I had to go through this reinvention. How would I uh, compete once again? Does everybody know their primary colors? Because this is a little bit of art education. One of them's red. You want to give me the second one? Blue. Blue? Okay, very good. Well, let's start with yellow second. <laughs> then we'll go to blue. <laughs> But did you know with those three colors, you literally can mix any color in the rainbow? So I wanted to come up with a simple acronym, something that I could lean into. So I came up with the art of doing business, A-R-T. And A would stand for alliance. The best way for me to separate myself or to have some jumping off point was to align myself with successful companies, with good brands come alongside and help them celebrate what they do. And then R stood for resourcefulness. It was that ability to not just paint, but to leverage that talent in a multitude of ways, whether it was through books or puzzles or mugs, publishing, speaking engagements. It was being resourceful and not staying in just one lane. You know, like a musician, a musician can perform live and have great concerts. But really where they sustain themselves is when they publish their work and they get it out into a broad audience. And then three, the third would be timing. It was looking for those windows of opportunities, special occasions, centennials, or whatever it may be. Well, after the bankruptcy, I asked my brother, I said, Bob, you know, it's one thing to show your work in galleries, but if you really want to make any money, I need to have my own gallery. Would you help me with that? If you look there, you can see it's called Cary Mangum Gallery. And Bob was willing to stand up and write alongside me. Shortly thereafter, I hired my first gallery director. Her name was Wheezy Gordon, and she was a spitfire. She was amazing. And for 10 years, she came alongside me, and we were able to show really all across the eastern U.S. 
to participate in lots of outdoor shows as well as indoor expos. She handled a lot of the publishing and Bob continued to be very supportive. One of the great ideas he came up with was during that time, what was that guy's name? Bob Tim Timberlake? Timberlake, yeah, Bob Timberlake. Bob owned North Carolina. I mean, I could not break in. And every time I would go say, well, oh, your work, oh, it reminds me of Bob Timberlake. And I go, who? <laughs> Bob Timberlake. So I thought, let me escape. So I got on my pony. Where'd it go? Got on my pony. No, <laughs> but God, Bob came up with this idea. He said, why don't you think about maybe getting some patrons? Why don't you get some sponsors to underwrite these trips? You get $1,000 from them, and in return, you give them $1,500 worth of credit towards a painting. Well, guess what? It worked. I mean, before long, we were taking trips to England, and to really stretch myself and to take on different subjects was amazing. To go to the Greek Isles, to capture these beautifully whitewashed buildings, pushed my skill set in watercolors to extraordinary heights. And at the same time, I could take these international scenes compete with other North Carolinians. They had no idea where I was coming from or what I was doing. We began to get some international publishers, and all of a sudden, a lot of these things were winding up literally all around the world in restaurants and hotels as they were being reproduced by the hundreds, if not thousands. Well, one of the best things that ever happened to me with this success, Wheezy was coming in for a landing and I needed some inside help managing money. So this young lady, Joy Ross, is a CPA, and she was working for my CPA, and they said, you know, maybe you could use somebody like her to come in part-time, help you out with the books. Well, 28 years later, Joy Ross is still with me, still oversees the operation, and she has helped really create and grow my name, my brand, beyond my wildest expectation. She handled the early staff that was instrumental in creating books, doubling the size of the gallery, and really allowing me to go out into the field and to do what I do best, and that's to paint. And North Carolina, without a doubt, is an artist's paradise. When you think about the beauty of the mountains to the Piedmont, to the coast, and then you mix it with four distinctive seasons, it's second to none. Now, when it comes to seasons, I'm gonna pick on Cynthia a little bit, because I remember doing this painting, and you know, you're always asking opinions. So I said, Cynthia, what do you think of this? She goes, Bill. I said, what? She said, what? Look at that. Can't you tell me what's wrong with that? I said, no, I can't tell you what's wrong. She said, you can't put all those flowers together. I said, what do you mean? They don't grow at the same time. I said, well, you're the only person that will know that. She said, no, no, no. I said, trust me, it's called artistic license. I can get away with it, and I did, and it was really good. I remember going to this subject matter with my middle son, Preston. And I said, Preston, next time we come back, that lighthouse is not going to be there. He said, what are you talking about? I said, they're going to move it inland. He said, no way. I said, way. I said, that's how much North Carolinians love their state. They prize their icons. I was doing this piece. Anybody recognize this area? This is Dockside down at Wilmington. Worked on this painting for about a week and a half, and I was sitting up on a ladder, and boats would kind of come and go, and one was backing up to me about eye level. He said, what you doing? I said, well, I'm doing a painting of the scene. Said, well, let me see what you're working on. So I flipped around, showed him some studies. He said, that's nice. He said, well, would you take a six pack for that? I said, no, no, I'm not gonna take a six pack. He said, well, how about a case? Would you take a case? I said, no, I don't think I'll take a case. So when you take all of that and you begin to round it up, it made me really think about just how unique and blessed we are to live in such an area. And then I began to reflect on my upbringing and began to think about Aunt Kate, and I began to think about all the good things that she would say and the fact that she was an extraordinary gardener 
and the way that she would preserve these fruits and vegetables out of her garden, I said, you know, I want to do the same thing. I want to preserve North Carolina for the next generation. So I want you to hear these words from Aunt Kate. They're pretty eloquent. I think we need to think about where we come from and how it used to be. It was after World War II that we got the paved roads and the electricity. Aunt Kate didn't waste anything. She'd take old shirts and curtains and turn them into colorful quilts. And she'd stuff her pantry with all the good things that she grew in her garden. I've done string beans, peas, and um, tomatoes. A lot of tomatoes. Just whatever comes along, I save it. I just hate to see something lie out there in the garden and go to ruin when I could put it up. And I just, I just love to do it. I believe have an obligation to preserve our heritage for future generations. Carolina Preserves is a combination of my paintings and the stories of special people. It's a celebration of our rich and diverse heritage. That's about as sweet and eloquent as you can be. Don't want anything to go to ruin. Want to put it up and preserve it, and that's really kind of what I did. So I took this painting of Aunt Kate's pantry, and I said, you know, I think there's a book around this idea of preserving different North Carolinian and artist perspectives of the state. So the title came to me one night. I said, it should be called Carolina Preserves. So as I did this concept, Bill Friday, former chancellor here, was so gracious to me, I went to him, and I said, Mr. Friday, I said, I've got this idea for a book, and it's to include different North Carolinians from all walks of life. And he said, Bill, you know, I like it. He said, but I don't cook. I said, no, it's not a cookbook. I said, it's going to be about North Carolinians, why they love the state, what they would say to their sons and daughters. He said, oh, oh, okay, good. He said, because I really didn't even have a recipe in my mind as to what I would give you. I said, well, that's great. So with that, I began to dream. And it took a team to really keep up with those expectations because not only did I want to do a, a book about different personalities of North Carolina, was it not only going to be a book, a coffee table book, a major coffee table book, but I wanted to do a film based on these individuals. So when I went to UNC TV, PBS, Tom Howell was the president. He said, Bill, this is... <laughs> absolutely perfect timing. He said, there's something out on the horizon called high definition, and we ought to do this film in high definition. And I said, well, what are you talking about? He said, we're talking about money. I said, well, how much money are you talking about? He said, the camera alone will be a quarter of a million dollars. I said, okay, I'll go fishing, we'll go find it. So with that, through a myriad of contacts and friends, I went to Bank of America, and they were gracious enough to underwrite it, the production of that, and give a gift to the state that was second to none, as well as an exhibition at the North Carolina Museum of History for third graders for that entire year. It was an amazing, amazing journey, one that I'm simply really proud of. Well, it took a unique team of talent, and Cindy Adams is here this evening, and she was the major contributor that would corral all these personalities, people from Dean Smith to Richard Petty, former governors, uh, you name it, was kind of a who's who of the state. And then Gene Davison was also instrumental, but the bedrock of it was joy. And those three kept it on spot and made it something that's really, even today, probably one of the best books I personally think in the state. So Hugh Morton, many of you are familiar with him. He certainly was a, a member here. But Mr. Morton, I would visit him. When he contributed to this, he said, many people have given me the impression 
that Grandf Grandfather Mountain is their favorite beloved mountain. And if this is true, it is no trivial task preserving it. He absolutely loved that mountain. And I remember him taking me out and showing me scenes. And my worst imagination was saying, artist Bill Mangum watched Hugh Morton fall to his death as he stands on these precarious premises. But he was so gracious in his gift. Many of you know Michael Jordan. I love this quote. This was capturing his backyard down in Wilmington. He said, I've told people that before you even set foot in North Carolina, you should take your shoes off because this is truly God's country. And as we mixed it up, the Farlow brothers, you'd never heard of them, but combined they carried the mail in North Carolina for over 100 years. And their little quote in their gift to the state said, our customers are so eager to see us, especially on the days we deliver their social security checks. Now, many of us are appreciative of that in, in our season of life, but the film really is where it, it, the rubber hit the road for them to go out into the field and to capture the creation of so many scenes. I guess one of the greatest honors was that Bill Friday came down to Mamers, North Carolina, interviewed Aunt Kate, and he made her feel like a rock star. She appeared on UNC TV for their fundraisers, went to book signings, even went to the governor's mansion and met with the first lady. Truly an amazing blessing. So all of that culminated to once again another expansion when we blew the doors out. We actually moved the gallery. Joy handled it. At our height, we had 17 on staff. We had over 500 galleries across the US that were exhibiting my work buying my work. We were able to publish it in a myriad of everything from mugs to puzzles. But I think what I really loved about retail was that you had a pulse. You could create something and then you could put it on display and immediately you would get feedback. Annually, we would have a meet the artist and if you give things away, they show. Over a two day period, we'd have over 3,000 people come through the gallery Right, Maggie? You okay, Maggie? Maggie is one of my former employees. She's, that was true. What an amazing. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> but it was so much fun to have uh, great collectors and then even to educate little ones and to inspire them. So when I talked about Alliance, that was also a part of going to great areas like the Biltmore State and helping them with their centennial to be the artist or to go to universities, like right here. Jim Van Hecke was a good friend that really had this idea of meeting with schools, publishing the work, and making it available to the alum. And when you think about it, nearly 750 to a million alumnus every year get to see work that you might create. Ironically, I came back to my hometown of Pinehurst, was fortunate enough to be incorporated, and was there that I met Mr. Dotson on a couple of occasions and uh, got lucky, was able to be the official artist for the US Open, but also to do a book celebrating the village's centennial. Pretty amazing and fantastic stuff. One thing backs into another. Blake Clark, who's a resident of Greensboro, loved my golf paintings, invited me to go play Augusta National. I said, that'd be a treat. At the same time, I was doing a painting of Augusta College. He said, why don't you bring that and show it to the pro while we're down there? So he walks me in, introduces me, pro says, hey, would you like to paint our golf courses? I said, yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I did a few paintings. Now, a lot of people are kind of curious, how did I come up with that perspective? Well, about right here is where my golf ball landed. <laughs> Not quite, but it did it turn out really well. And then as everything, it's a domino effect, and that led to being the artist for Pebble Beach for a number of years. And then back home to North Carolina, where I have the privilege of being on the North Carolina Golf Panel, and we have the arduous task every year of playing 25 to 30 golf courses and ranking them. Wow, don't you feel sorry for me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Well, Carolina Preserves had a second life. And that came in the firm form of furniture. This is Jeff Beeston. 
and he was the vice president of Klausner Case Goods. And that company got acquired by a handful of people, and they were getting ready to celebrate their 50th anniversary. Well, nothing more is better than to capture one of the great craftsmen, that was Casey. And the idea was, if we took an authentic story and you combined it with really good case goods, you could, you could really set yourself apart. And what it did was it gave the sales force speaking points that really helped them grow the collection. And Klausner at the time was really kind of an Oldsmobile. It had lost a little bit of his traction. But having a new voice, having someone that could sort of share where you got that inspiration, talk about the beauty of the Blue Ridge Parkway and incorporate it into the textures and colors, or go to the coast and see how sea oats and sand could create a unique patina for furniture. That's really what the collaboration was all about. And it was a home run. In seven years, we created nine different home collections. And it really kind of took the industry by storm and Klausner became a big hit. Well, do you think I like North Carolina? Yeah, yeah, I do. The mountains, the Piedmont, I mean, its beauty is glorious. But there is a side of North Carolina that I see that's disturbing too. And that's the plight of homelessness. You know, today in every community across the state, every corner, it's there. It's peeking around at us. People flying signs. You know, sometimes they're heartfelt and then other times they're rather entertaining and you want to give Bill five bucks, help him find a rich woman. I like that. It's kind of clever. But for me in 1987, I was having breakfast with a friend when this gentleman was in the restaurant at Hardy's and he was looking at me. And you know, sometimes when someone looks at you, they'll nod and you just nod back. And my friend Peter looked over his shoulder and he said, oh man, he said, that guy looks really rough. I said, yeah, but I, I think he's homeless. Now, 1987. So as we were leaving and exchanging goodbyes, I left the restaurant and Michael was outside and he approached me for some money. And like everybody, a lot, many people, you're not comfortable giving someone money, but I said, are you hungry? He said, yeah. So I'm thinking, good Samaritan. I'll take him in and buy him some breakfast. Well, Michael helped himself. He ordered lots of stuff. And for whatever reason, I just wanted to hear a little bit more. And as he told me where he was from and kind of his plight, I said, I've heard this place called Greensboro Urban Ministry. It's a night shelter. Would you like for me to take you there? And he said, that'd be great. So I took Mike there, dropped him off. It was an old abandoned grocery store at the time. They actually put the mats out on the, on the concrete floor. But he was quite happy, quite at home. And as I was getting ready to exchange my goodbyes with him, I reached and I grabbed my wallet and I pulled it out, and I'm sure Michael thought, well, he's going to give me five bucks, ten bucks, something to help me over. And I gave him my business card. And I said, why don't you call me in a couple of days and let me know how you're doing? And he did. And that turned into a three-year friendship. Well, ultimately, I became Mike Saavedra's caretaker. Because not only was Michael homeless, he was mentally ill. He was a paranoid schizophrenic that really had been wandering the country since the age of 15. And his parents were delighted that he finally found a place in Greensboro. I don't know why God used me in that particular way, but there is a passage in Hebrews that says, be careful to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have entertained angels. Now, I wouldn't have called Michael an angel back then, but also in the second verse, it talks about us coming alongside and binding ourselves to assist them. And whatever reason, there was a brotherhood, there was a camaraderie there until he passed away. Ironically, during that time, I was asked by a neighbor if I would use my talents to help create a painting for a little program called the Honor Card. And in 1988, I did this painting of Old Greensboro, and we put it on the card, and we took the print sales to underwrite it. And the way the card worked was if you purchased it or if you made a donation of $5, you would send it to a friend or a family member and it says a gift would, is being given 
in your honor to support the needy and homeless in our community. And would you believe that year that card raised $50,000 for Greensboro Urban Ministry in 1988? Well, I really kind of thought I was one and done. You know, I was moving on back painting internationally when they came back and asked me to do it again. And it stirred in my soul that I could do it. How, how could I not turn it down? So I began to volunteer down at Urban Ministry on Wednesday mornings, did a prayer breakfast, and it was during those volunteer times that I would meet individuals and they would share with me their plight, but they would also talk about how they would come alongside and help individuals like Randy and Howard create a car wash business. Even during this time, there were veterans. Veterans made a huge impact on the population of homelessness. At one time, they were 25% of what was sitting in shelters. And in Asheville, they have this great veterans uh, area where they have 246 beds to help serve those in need. And then there are true life stories like Bonnie Harris, who actually came through the shelter. She was a crack addict. She got off of it, and she also decided to start her own ministry. So amazing stories. So the honor card, what's so exciting about it is that 100% of every contribution goes directly back to the agencies that support it. And over 35 years, the mission has been the same, and that's to show God's compassion for our neighbors in need and to build a stronger community together. So we're on this big sort of anniversary, 35 years, it's gonna encompass with a book, but all of it would not come about if I didn't have some great partners. After underwriting the card for 16 years through the print sales, I decided I wanted to expand it outside of Greensboro and with First Union then to Wachovia and then Wachovia to Wells. Wells has been a partner for 19 years, helping to underwrite the production as well as an anonymous couple those two have allowed us to take that program to 15 different cities now annually <laughs> that use the honor card. And last year it raised right at $600,000 and to date about 10 million towards the plight of homelessness. So it really is all about partnership. And today, as I turn over a new leaf and I think about where do I go? I shut my gallery down about four years ago because I wanted my weekends off. I wanted to be with some special grandkids. That speaking of you, right over there, and one on the back row, yes. And I love this quote by Pressfield. It says, the most important thing about art is to work. You know, nothing else matters except sitting down every day and trying. Now you got that blank canvas in front of you and you never know, this may be the greatest piece I will ever create. I love that. I love that opportunity. So today, I've changed mediums. I'm working out of my studio. It's by appointment. You can come anytime you like. But I've gone from watercolors to acrylics that's allowed me to dive into a medium that has amazing textures, allows me to do some extraordinary creations, whether I pour the paint or I'd put it on a palette. I can work at a scale that I've never been allowed to do before, where watercolors was sort of restrictive, but I also haven't forgotten where I came from. Remember that? And that as I still love to celebrate the landscapes. So today, as I produce these paintings, uh, the neat thing is I feel like I'm on the launching pad and my career is just beginning. I'm so grateful to so many of my folks, my fans, my collectors that showed up here today. And uh, it all culminated in one of my latest books called Transitions that really kind of talks about that. So as I think about perspective and I think about where I came from, I get lots of fan mail. Sometimes it comes from congressmen or governors. I've been fortunate enough to get a nice letter from the president on both sides. Both sides were kind of fun. I get great fan mail from my art buddies, Joe Miller, artist, sending it to me, Artist Supremo. Even kids, you know, who think I'm the world's greatest artist because I put them on my website. You know, it's easy to ply them with that. But one day I got this letter, and this letter to this day still kind of tugs at my heart. William Mangum, Esquire. I like to just drag that out, Esquire. 
So as I opened it up, I, it says, Dear Bill, it says, You were most thoughtful and gracious to give me a copy of your new book, Greensboro Roots and Renaissance, for my birthday. It's a pleasing mix of your older and newer paintings, and we have several prints of these paintings, including Letitia's Garden at Blandwood. I view this painting several times each day as it hangs over the commode in the bathroom <laughs> that I frequent most often. Yeah. I will always enjoy this book best always cordially, Phil. See, you never know how your art's gonna move somebody. I mean, that, 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 is that not true? That is so true. So, in thinking about where do I go from here, this is one of the most important things to me today. That's my grandkids. So in the middle is Jaden. Jaden is 15. She's with us this evening. Gabriella is to the right and Samuel's to the left, 11 and 8. And there is nothing more fun than to get them in the studio and get dirty. As Bob Ross says, let's get a little crazy. And we have at it and we have the best time. So what I'm trying to implore to these kids are some of the fundamentals that I remember growing up as a kid, and that was from my mom. Remember, it just takes time, honey. And then Pops would always say, get a good education. You haven't got to go to school. You can get an education every day. You can get an education just sewing, gardening. It doesn't really matter. And then finally, my Aunt Kate would say, remember where you come from and how it used to be. Pretty powerful things. And I'm so grateful for what North Carolina has done to me. So, Irma Bombeck, here it is, closing statement. I love this quote by this great humorist. It says, when I stand before God at the end of my life, I would hope that, one, that I would not have a single bit of talent left and could say, I used everything you gave me. Thank you.